Well, welcome, everyone. We're going to start with a carol that I think is familiar to many, but please stand with us if you're able, and we'll join our voices together. I'm the pastor here at Amberley Presbyterian Church, and I just want to welcome you this evening where we are going to gather together to worship uh, the coming uh, God, the coming Christ, and uh, I pray that you will sense God's presence in this place. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us online as well, and uh, thank you for tuning in. We are going to celebrate Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to start with a call to worship, um, and I'm going to say... This is the day the Lord has made, and you are going to respond. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But you'll see it's got an exclamation mark. And so when there are little kids here, I always say, you know, what does an exclamation mark mean, right? And they'll tell me what? It means you're? Well, let's pretend we are. <laughs> right? So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's pray. God of this stable and manger and God of us, open our eyes to your presence in the world. Give us hearts that are happy to hear the song of the angels and help us to find our way to the manger. Through Jesus, child of the manger and Christ of the cross, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Okay? <laughs> Joy to the world. i 
seated. It's Christmas. The day we have waited and prepared for is finally here. Do you remember all the candles that we have lit? Yes, the first candle was lit was the candle of hope. And then the candle of peace. The third time we lit the candle of joy. And then love. Today on Christmas, we light the center candle. Our waiting has ended. Jesus is born. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. When we look at this candle, we remember that Jesus is the light of the world and is coming again. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. God sent Jesus to give hope, peace, love, and joy to all people. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus. On this Christmas Eve, help us welcome you into our hearts. Give us courage to hope strength to seek peace, fill our spirits with joy, and extend our hands with love. Amen. He's a dog, and his name is Twice. I have to call him twice. He won't come if I just call him once. He's going to help me tell you the story of the very first Christmas. Ooh, I like that story. I remember my very first Christmas when I was just a little doggy. I got a can of dog food for Christmas. I'm not talking about your first Christmas. I'm talking about the very first Christmas, way back when Jesus was born. Oh, I like that story. <laughs> can I tell it? You can help me act it out. You can be the sheepdog. The what? Sheepdog, and I'll be a shepherd. So I'm a sheepdog, and you're a German shepherd. Not a German shepherd, a shepherd. I take care of the sheep. Hmm, then what do I do? You have to round up the sheep. Oh, are they square? No, you have to keep them from running away. Oh, I can do that. I'll just bark if they get away. Uh, good. Pretend it's dark outside. 
Who said that? Why well, did? Oh, I couldn't see you. It's too dark. Suddenly, there's a bright light in the sky. I know what it is. What? It's Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. It isn't Rudolph. Look, it has wings. Daddy, it must be my daddy. Huh? He's a bird dog. It's not a dog. <laughs> Are you afraid? Listen, it's saying something. It's saying, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. <laughs> hey, I know this part. I bring you good news. Let there be pizza on Earth. Not pizza. Peace. Is he an angel? Yes. Look at all the angels. The sky is full of them. He said we should go to Bethlehem and look for a child. Mm, did the kid run away? No, he can't run. Did he walk away? He can't even walk yet. Mm, he crawled away. No, he's just a newborn baby. How did they lose him? They didn't lose him. Then why do we have to look for him? This is a special baby. This is the son of God. Wow. We're going to worship the baby. His name is Jesus. Let's go. I'll round up the square sheep. We'll put the sheep in their pen, and the night watchman will take care of them. <laughs> now what's the matter? Who's going to take care of us? From now on, Jesus will. That's the good news. <laughs> Well, we should sing, uh, and, I'm, and I'm stalling just a little bit to give our, s our lead singer an opportunity to get <laughs> to the platform from behind. Who had nothing to do with the play the, at all. Behind nothing. the curtain. What did I miss? Uh, behind the you curtain. You were just there. missed. It was like yeah. Pokeroo was here. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let's join our voices together. Please stand if, if you're able, and, uh, and we'll sing together. Yes. 
I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. 
And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That when you hear the Christmas story, it sounds perfect, doesn't it? You know, I grew up with Charlie Brown. I mean, not literally, but watching Charlie Brown. And, and that's how I heard the Christmas story for the very first time. So thank you, Charles Schultz. It was perfect, perfect. You know, the Christmas story didn't start with an angel appearing to Mary. The Christmas story begins with an angel appearing to a couple that were too old to have children and, and to tell them that they were finally going to have a child, which is kind of perfect because in those days, if you couldn't have children, people thought you were cursed or uh, if you couldn't have children, they thought that you were bad in some way or that you had done, you, you know, you had done something in a previous life or uh, you, you were out of favor with God. And so this angel appears to Elizabeth and Zechariah and he, the, uh, the angel tells them that you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John. And he will announce the coming of the Messiah to the Jews who have waited forever. And so it's kind of perfect because it was foreshadowing that when Jesus grew up and was a man, part of his ministry would be to the people who thought that they were out of favor with God for something that they had done or something that their parents had done or, you know, that they thought that they would never find favor. And that part of it is perfect. It's perfect. And then finally, an angel appears to Mary. Mary is a teenager, maybe 13 or 14 years old. And the angel says to Mary, God has found favor in you. You have found favor with God. To which Mary might have said, like, I'm 14, like, how could I have found favor with God? Like, well, like well, I'm not old enough to find favor with anybody, right? How could I do that? I, 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 I haven't lived long enough to find favor with God. And the angel says, no, it doesn't matter because God has chosen you, which is perfect. It's perfect because throughout the ministry of Jesus, he would go around showing people favor. He would show favor to people who had done nothing to earn his favor. In fact, Jesus would show favor to people who had done things to create displeasure between them and God. And so this was like a really cool foreshadowing. The story is kind of perfect. And then maybe the best part of all is the first group of people to find out about Jesus that Jesus was born was a shepherd. 
Now, we might not completely understand shepherds because we don't have them typically in this day and age, but shepherds were outsiders. They were kind of outcasts. And, and they were, you know, certainly in terms of the religious system. The religious system of the day said you couldn't touch anything dead. And shepherds were always handling and dealing with the dead things. And, and so they would raise these sheep, and they would give these sheep to good people, and the good people would go and sacrifice these, these lambs and, and get close to God. Meanwhile, the shepherds were outsiders. It would be easy It would be so easy to be a cynical, even skeptical shepherd. They were outsiders of the religious system. And yet, in this perfect story, so perfect it seems like someone just made it up, an angel appears to the shepherds, these outsiders, and says, we want you to be the first to know. We want you to be the first to know that God is doing something, that that God is doing something in this world, that God has done what has never been done before, that you have been invited. It's, It's an amazing thing that God chose these shepherds, these outsiders, to be the first to know, to be the first to be invited to what God has done, which is perfect. Because when Jesus would grow up and be a man, In his ministry, he would spend so much time with people who were outsiders, people outside the religious system, people outside of relationship with God and say, God loves you and you're invited as well. So the whole story is almost suspiciously perfect. And then there's this broader narrative that you've got to know about, the history, about 1,500 miles from where Jesus is being born is Caesar Augustus. Now, he was the first emperor of Rome, and you may remember studying him in some history class. He reigned for 40 years, and the interesting thing about Caesar Augustus that makes it fit in with this story is that he is the adoptive son of Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar was called the divine leader. He was given the the status of deity, which meant that Caesar Augustus, get this, was considered the son of God. So you have the son of God in Rome who is ruling the world, and then you have the son of God being born in Bethlehem at the same time, and you have this tension and this drama. It is such a perfect story. (laughs) Eventually, the only time in the world that you will ever hear about Caesar Augustus is a paragraph in a book or in a lecture in college or university, the only time Caesar Augustus is mentioned is in the story about Jesus. The first emperor of Rome is a footnote to a Jewish carpenter. It is absolutely perfect. But it's so perfect that it kind of makes you suspicious. Because life isn't perfect. There are no subplots and foreshadowing and everything kind of works out. When we were children, it was easy to accept that it's true. But as we grow older, we tend to slide into the category of myth and fable and fairy tale. And this perfect nativity scene doesn't help, does it? It's almost like a cartoon. Everything is perfect, perfect face, perfect smile, little blonde baby Jesus. Can I ask you how many Middle Eastern children are born with blonde hair? (laughs) The animals are, are perfect, right? Every woman who has ever had a baby knows that if you just had a baby, you don't look like that. Right? In that stinky building that she had a baby in, you don't look like that. And then there is that song that we all love to sing. And I promise you, it ain't a silent night. Right? 
And what do we do? What do we do? We take this story that is so perfect. Who could believe it? Like who? Is it so mystical and so magical? Who could believe it? And yet we create, right, this kind of thing. So no wonder when we get older, we take the story that maybe meant so much to us in childhood and we shove it into a category of myth and legend and folklore but it's not even a good fairy tale or a myth because um, with a myth or a fairy tale, at least you have a moral to the story. Remember the story about the boy who cried wolf? My mom used to tell me this one all the time, maybe because I lied a lot. Um, The boy who cried wolf, right? And the villagers would come out, the boy cried wolf, and the villagers would come out, and there was no wolf. And then he did it again and again and again, and finally the boy, like there was really a wolf, and then the boy cried wolf, and then nobody came. Gobble, gobble. (laughs) right? And the importance of that is to tell the truth. What do we learn from this? Make reservations? Call ahead? Uh, There's really no application, no moral of this story. It's not even a good myth, and yet that's what it becomes. And of course, it does become, because it just, it does become that because it's so perfect. It's really too good to be true. We take all of the rough edges out, the dirt, the sound, the smell, and we place it on a mantle somewhere, right? Or we put it on the front yard and we kind of drive by it. And, we, and, and, and it becomes a fairy tale or a cartoon with no meaning. Maybe for a momentary inspiration that takes us back to our childhood, but certainly nothing into adulthood. But then, to the rescue, come two guys who tell the Christmas story, Matthew and Luke. Now, Matthew was a follower of Jesus, and he knew Jesus. Matthew knew Mary. Matthew knew John, who took care of Mary until Mary died. Matthew, who had access to information, who sat down and did not begin once upon a time, he begins the story this way. Abraham had a son who had a son who had a son, and he meticulously goes through the genealogy that when we read the scripture in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, we get kind of bored with it. He begot him, and he begot her, and begot, you know, all that stuff, right? But what he's doing is he's saying that Jesus was an actual person who actually lived, who was connected to all of the right people in the story. And that's how he tells it. That it's just, I'm telling you this because it is so difficult to believe. And it begins this way. Matthew 1 verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. And then he dives into all the details. There was a man named Joseph betrothed to a girl named Mary, and he finds out that she's pregnant, and he's got a dilemma on his hands, and the story begins. It's so realistic, right? And these kinds of things happen, right? But Luke, Luke is even better. Listen to this. Luke is even better. Luke, who wasn't one of Jesus' disciples, he was a doctor. But Luke knew Peter, and he knew John. And Luke knew James, the brother of Jesus. And so Luke sits down and he realizes there are so many stories and so many accounts that there, there's, there's some conflicting details. And so he says, you know, I'm, I want to I wanna get this right. And so he begins the story of the birth of Jesus. And he says in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, a lot of people are, are trying to say a lot of stuff. And, and, and it, it, this is just so amazing. But this, I'm telling you, isn't 70 years before or after or 60 or 50 years. This was during the actual time of events. This is when it actually happened. And so he says, there's so many people trying to get this right, he says. Verse 2, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He says, there are so many stories and accounts from people who were actually there. And then he says in verse 3, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So he says, I've decided... I'm going to put an orderly account together because I, ac- I have access to Peter. 
I have access to John. I have access to Matthew and to Mary. I have access to all these eyewitnesses. I decided to put together an account that would accurately reflect what actually happened because nobody is going to believe it. Verse 3 to 4. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That's what he says. So that you know the certainty of what you have been taught. I want you to know that this isn't a myth. This isn't a fairy tale or a fable. This is not oral tradition that has been passed on from generation to generation and then exaggerated and embellished. This happened among us. There are eyewitnesses to this event, and they are still with us. And so, and so, I have thoroughly investigated, Luke says, and I'm about to tell you a story of how it actually, in history, happened. It isn't a fable. It isn't a myth. He anchors the birth of Jesus to a very specific time in history, and he says this in chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And then he goes on in detail so so that people could actually track it down in history. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Extra biblical material actually tells us that Syria had a governor, right? named Quirinius, and, he was, and while he was governor, he had two censuses taken. So this isn't once upon a time in a land far, far away. This isn't a legend or folklore. This is during the reign of Caesar while Quirinius was governor of Syria. This was actually happening. The man, and then he tells us about a man named Joseph was visited by an angel. And Mary was visited by an angel, and he took her as his wife. And they went to Bethlehem to register because every male had to go to his hometown. And while he was there, while they were there, she gave birth to a son, and they named him Jesus. And it turns out he would be the savior of the entire world. So here's my question to you. What if it's true? What if, what if it's true? What if the faith that you had as a child was the right faith? What if these events actually took place in history? What if you knew the certainty that Luke wanted you to have? that these were events that took place in such a way that everyone knew that God had done something unique in the world. If it's true, what the angel said is so significant. It's so significant for every single person in the entire world. When the angel said this, Luke, in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, the, the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. The people like Elizabeth and Zechariah who thought they must have fallen out of favor with God. Look what's happened in my life. Things aren't going right for me. God never answers my prayer. If there's a God, well, then God must not love me. To which the angel would say, no, this is a message for you as well. Because God does know you. And God does love you. And God does hear your prayer. In fact, God chose someone just like you to be a part of history. It's good news to all people, even people who wonder, what what can I do to ever earn God's favor? How can I ever earn God's favor? How can I ever be good enough to earn God's favor like, like Mary? And the angel would say, no, this is for you. 
God just loves you. God just favors you, not because of anything you've done, but just because he loves you. It's to all the people, all the people like the shepherds, those who would say, oh, I'm not a religious person. I can totally identify with the shepherds, right? I'm, I'm an outsider. I don't even like religious people. Religious people don't like me. We have an agreement. I visit my parents during Easter and Christmas, and we don't talk about it, right? Because I'm not one of them. And the angel would say, you are a part of the all. For there is great joy for all because Jesus would demonstrate in an unmistakable remarkable way that he came for those who were nothing like him. For all the people in the town of David, a savior. What makes this story perfect, what makes this story that we long to be real, and what makes this so perfect for you and for me is that God didn't simply send us a second chance. God didn't send you uh, another list of commandments. God sent you and me. God sent us exactly what we needed. A Savior. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. It's perfect. But it's better than perfect. It's true. It's better than perfect. It actually happened. It's not a standalone story that we can look at from time to time. You know, at this time of year, it's a story that encompasses your story because you are part of the all. He came for you. And every you, (laughs) you will ever meet for the rest of your life. It's better than perfect. It's true. And he did it for me, and he did it for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for preserving this story for 2,000 years. Thank you that it's not a fable or fairy tale. Thank you for documenting the birth of your son so that it is unmistakable and irresistible. I pray for those who are always trying to win your favor. I pray that they will relax in the fact that you favor them because you love them. For those who say they're an outsider, who say I'm not really a church person, I don't know if I believe any of this or understand it, I pray that they in this moment in time would catch a glimpse that Jesus came specifically for the outsiders. Father, for those who grew up hearing the story, I pray it would come alive in a new and meaningful way as we celebrate not simply the birth of a baby, but the birth of our Savior, the Savior of the world. Thank you that it is perfect. Thank you that it's true. Thank you that it is for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to take a little bit of time, and we're going to receive the offering. Uh, Please, for those of you who are visiting with us, please receive this service as a gift. Uh, And uh, I'll let Sherry um, pray. Thank you. Uh, Ask the ushers to come forward. Let us pray. We celebrate the birth of the Holy Child. Although born in humble surroundings, Jesus' presence surrounds all who call upon his name. The hope born in a manger long ago is birthed again. We gratefully offer these gifts as a way to provide hope for all God's children. We rejoice in knowing that your ministry is strengthened by our gifts and prayers. We pray in the name of the babe in the manger. Amen.
Mary knew. I do believe she knew. She knew. Okay, so we're going to close our service in a, in a really special way. I believe you've all received a candle, correct? Yes? Anyone didn't get a candle? Could you just put your hand out and Nancy will come and get you one? And if you could make sure that you have one of these little plastic drippy thingy holders. You've got that, right? Everyone's good? Okay, so what we're going to do is this. I'm going to light the Christ candle and then I'm going to pass the flame to uh, the first person at the end of each row. And if you would then pass, pass it to the next person and just along the way, you get what I'm saying, right? Now, um, here's, here's what I, I have noticed. I'm gonna get you to stay seated uh, until the very last time we sing and probably sing a cappella, um, and then we'll get you to stand. But when you stand, please be mindful of the flame. Um, Please blow out the candle before you hug anybody because I've seen people's hairspray go on fire. So we're going to be very mindful uh, that we have a, a lit candle. And for some of you, you have glow sticks, so that's even cooler. I totally think glow sticks are cooler, but here we go. We're going to do this, and we're going to start singing. We can, we can sing, guys. So Jesus 
so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly Filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the magi, and the peace of the Christ child, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forevermore. Merry Christmas. Carefully blow it out. <laughs> Merry Christmas! We have a service tomorrow morning, so come on back! <laughs> we have some gifts for you as you walk out the door and some, some treats, so please stick around.